Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Preacher's Corner. I'm Pastor Jay, and today we're going to get into 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and take a ride through uh, some pretty awesome points that uh, good Lord would dig out for me to be able to share with you today. Uh, things like the fact that you are the letter that God wrote to the people around you. So in order for God to be known, His His word must be heard, His letter must be read, and you are that letter. That's kind of a cool thought. And, and the recognition that when you heard that, it might have struck a chord of fear in your soul as saying, well, I wouldn't know what to say, well, I wouldn't know what to do, and I don't, un I don't understand. But then the second point that we have today is recognizing the sufficiency of God to be able to use you in capacity as his letter to the people around you. And that, no, you really probably aren't sufficient for the task, but the Holy Spirit that has sealed you unto the day of your salvation, the very Holy Spirit, that is the literal extension of God that lives inside of you and has prepared you in every way to live a life in holiness before the Lord is the same agent that's going to bring forth the knowledge of his word to the world around you. So it doesn't have to be your sufficiency because the Lord is already taking care of that by indwelling you, by living inside of you. And so as you are his letter, he will literally share that letter through you if you're a willing vessel. And of course, there's always the understanding when you're talking about being a letter and you're talking about the sufficiency of God that there will be those who will not hear. And at the end of this chapter, you discover those whose minds were blinded. And so we'll get into all of those things and in detail today, and I hope that's a blessing to your soul. Father, we are grateful for everything that you're doing in us. We're thankful for what you've done through us to this point, and we look forward to what you have planned in the future. Lord, we, we pray that all things will work together in their perfect timing, and that, Father, it will become to the good of those around us, that they may be able to read your letter that you have written in us, and Lord, that, that through your sufficiency, their eyes would no longer be blinded, but that they would be able to see, hear, and come to know the God of their salvation. We pray that you will bless us with courage today and acceptance today in the work that you have called every single one of your children to do. And it will be well with our souls as we rejoice in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read through uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, and then we'll get back to our points. And the scripture goes forward to say, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some other epistles, of condemnation or commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Paul says, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because the glory that excels. For if, it, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. 
Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord." So many things that could be gleaned from this today, but I'm only going to pull out three uh, minor points. And and my challenge to you is really uh, to get into the Word of God for yourself and pull out the other stuff because there's so much. I mean, certainly we could spend three weeks just on this one chapter of the amount of, of information that's there. No doubt I've probably spent weeks on it before, but... Now I'm just going to torture you with a few things and you're going to have to dig the rest out because it's so awesome when you when you discover for yourself instead of having to be told you discover for yourself the, the majesty that is found in that scripture. So at the first point that I've got for you in this chapter today is found in the first f- four verses and this point is that you are God's letter. It's just fantastic to sit there and think about because the way in which you think, the way in which you speak, the way in which you draw out information, you share information is going to be completely different from anybody else around you because you carry a different type of personality than anybody else around you. Just as an example are the four Gospels that are written from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've got four Gospels, and each one of them is written in a very distinct manner from the other. Information that was thought of by Matthew is not necessarily considered by Mark, and information from John is not necessarily considered by Luke. And 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 within these four Gospels, you have a whole retelling of, of the majority of the events that would happen in Jesus' life and through his ministry. But in any one given gospel, you only have one given perspective. And that's the reality of the Word of God that's going to come into the world through us, God's children. Because as we share our faith, we're sharing it from our perspective of what the Holy Spirit's doing inside of us. And so from us, we're, we, like myself, I am one letter that God has written unto all of you. As I'm sharing this gospel with you right now, as I'm sharing these teachings with you, I'm talking to the Lord with you, and, and that you understand by now, certainly several of you that's been hanging out with me for over a year now, you understand my personality, you've got an idea of the inflection and tones of my voice, what gets me revved up, what get, what's just normalizing, and and you start to understand that letter. You start to hear that letter and read that letter and you understand that letter. And then it opens up the letter of 2 Corinthians to you or it opens up 1 Corinthians or James or Mark or the other things that we have read. You begin to look at them and you say, wow, okay, I see this. I see what you're saying. Because this letter opens up that letter for us to receive from the Lord. But as we receive from the Lord, now it is necessary for you to become that letter to other people so that you open the word of God and you share the things that you have received from God rather rather as a beginning point that you begin to have your eyes open. Remember back in verse number 16 to 18, he says that it that their eyes were blinded. And what he's talking about in that blinding is the fact that they, they couldn't see clearly. They had this veil that was blocking their ability to see the things of God clearly. Well, the reality is true that that many of us have, have uh, come to faith in, in Christ, but we begin to read the Word of God and it's blurry. It, 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 it doesn't make all that much sense. And, and, and so we try to study the Word of God, but we don't really know what to look for. We don't know what to consider. And that is why church is so important. 
is because this is the foundational rock that Jesus has placed us into himself as the bodies of Christ for the purpose of being able to have that starting point, to have that 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 growing in, in the word of God, that knowledge base that we could start working off of so that we start listening to one of God's letters to be able to understand God's words so that then God can work through us and the Holy Spirit to start revealing himself through his word for us to become one of his letters. So let me explain all of that. Here at Martin Baptist Church, God has put me to be a letter so that I, I can share the word of God with the church. And, and the pastors of all these other churches around us are all letters that were set there by God to be read of the congregations, to, to, to understand the, their connection with God's word. And as the word of God is shared, and as the people are starting to receive from the teachings, and they say, oh yeah, okay, I'm, I get this now. I, I see this. And, and they start to study for themselves they start to get into the word of God and and it starts to become exciting this is when God begins to to write them as a letter and, and thus when when they have received of the word of God and now they're on the journey from just listening to the pastor talk about it to studying it for themselves pretty soon they're going to be that letter that goes out into the area of their world the area of their life and proclaim these things as as they have received them and so others will now have a letter that would be written to them which will be that person to bring the word of god into their lives so that they too can be impacted and this is how the word of god spreads so our first point today is to recognize that you are god's letter for the people around you and as often I'm found as being said that th that there are people in your life that you're the only one that's going to be able to reach them because your pastors never met them. Uh, other people in the community don't have anything to do with them. They don't go in the same circles. Uh, that, that, there's, there's a lot of people that you may be in contact with that, that only you in that particular area of, of maybe even your church, only you are the one is in contact with them. And so your life needs to become the letter that they read about Jesus living in you to encourage them to hear the gospel to receive the gospel and to follow god that's your letter and then i have my letter and then uh, any any of other god's children ha are the letters that god has in this world to reveal his power his promises his love his authority and judgment his justice i mean all of these things are summed up in the letter that is your life and that's why Paul was saying in the very first verse, or very first verse, he says, do we, do we need to have letters of commendation to come to you? Seriously, do we need letters of com commendation from you? He says, no, you don't understand. You are the letter. <laughs> he says, you are our epistle. Now, the word epistle is just, it's real simple. That's a Greek terminology for the word letter. And so he says, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and ready by all men. You, you are it. You, you don't need some type of special writing. You don't need some kind of, of certification or some kind of, of thing to, to go forth with God's word. All you need is a heart that loves God and, and a heart that loves people. If you love God and you love people, you're going to be the letter of God to those people, period. Now, that's one of the challenges that we have in our modern day, isn't it? Is loving God and loving people. Yeah, we could reach the barrier of where we learn to love God. Whew, but that barrier of loving people... <laughs> <laughs> that that might be a hang up for some of us anyway but nevertheless that is what is necessary he said you are our epistle in verse three he says clearly 
Now, in, in some translations, you might see this where where the word, like in the first verse, you see as some, and you see this word others, and it, and it seems to be italicized, or it seems to be uh, looks different in the writing of that, that that translation than any others because that word doesn't exist in in the Greek or as we come down and he says as the epistles of commendation to you or letters that word also is not found in the Greek this is these are fillers these are filler words that are in connection to the overall structure of the sentence to try and make sense of this as concerning the English and so if we were to read in English what it would be written in as word for word in the, the Greek would say, or do we need as some epistles of commendation to you or of commendation from you? Uh, but they, they added in letters uh, to in connection to the epistles of commendation. The word letters is the same as the word epistles. And so they added that in to be able to give more context for your understanding to read. And amen. No crime there. But it comes down to verse number three. He says, clearly you are, and the words you are also uh, italicized. And so you'll see that those those particular words would would not necessarily have been uh, in in the Greek as, as recognized as you are. But this is the way in which they were able to bring it out as concerning the conversation that has begun in, in 2 Corinthians 3 is recognizing the, the whole of the church as being the epistle that is written. And so he says, clearly you are a letter from Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on the tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. In other words, this isn't going to be the, the same as when Moses received the stones. And of course, this whole this whole chapter carries forth understanding of the, the letter as referring to the law that was given in comparison to the Spirit. And so that he does not say that the letter is evil or bad or wrong and that the Spirit is replacing all of that other, but he's, he's telling us that the letter must become the Spirit within us. Uh, in other words, that the letter is what is going to be used by the Holy Spirit for conviction. The letter is going to be used by the Holy Spirit for, for repentance and for a, a knowledge of hope and for an ability of, of obedience even for the children of God to be pleasing to their Father. So he says that you're not written with ink, but by the Holy Spirit of the living God. I love that, verse number three. And by the way, it brings us to the second point is concerning the Holy Spirit of God is what brings forth the sufficiency to be able to serve the Lord to begin with. Apart from the Holy Spirit of God, none of us would be sufficient to be able to serve the Lord because none of us would have the, the tenacity, none of us would have the ability, none of us would have the, the capacity to be able to even consider the, the holiness of the things of God. But through the Holy Spirit, we are able because He makes us able. He makes us capable. He makes us uh, fully able to do His will. And so we find... Uh, as we come to verse number four and we work our way down to verse number 12, he says, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And this is the recognition in verse number five that, that it's not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us, as found in Titus chapter number uh, 3 and verse number 5 down to 7. He says, not, not by the works of righteousness we've done. We understand that that is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. In, in, in Ephesians chapter number 2, right? Uh, For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves is the gift of God. But we are his workmanship created unto good works for his good pleasure. So we understand that, that within ourselves, there is zero sufficiency that would give us an ability to be able to serve God at any time. 
but that it is the seal of the Holy Spirit that has been put within us that gives us the sufficiency, gives us the insight, the ability to understand the things of God and to know them. As would be revealed by 1 Corinthians chapter 2, again in, the, in our last study, that it, that it was say that the natural man... Uh, verse number or chapter 2 and verse between 12 and 16 he says the natural man cannot perceive the things of god neither can he know them for they're spiritually discerned and so we understand that the word of god be a book that is closed to the natural heart that is necessary for one to be saved in order to even begin to understand the the, the word of god the things of god and so that he would say that it is certainly not the sufficiency of ourselves that we might be able to think that we are anything from ourselves, but our sufficiency, it, it, indeed, it comes from God for the purpose being his letter. Remember? It comes down in verse number six, and he says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. You often hear the point, God doesn't call the qualified God qualifies those he calls. Well, the point being made by the Apostle Paul here when he said in verse number 6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Yeah, even the Apostle Paul, who had much knowledge of the word of God. In fact, he was an active uh, rabbi. He was a servant of of the the Jews of Judaism, he was orthodox. He he was he was knowledgeable in every single way. But he's recognized that he was apart from the Holy Spirit of God. He was a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. He 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 did not have the sufficiency to be what he what he was of himself. For that was all that he had was himself to work out of. But now recognizes that his sufficiency comes through the new covenant by the Holy Spirit because of God dwelling within him. And he says that, that he made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not concerning the letter but of the Spirit. It's very important as this, this distinction that he makes. He says, not of the law. In other words, my ministry is not from the law, and my sufficiency isn't of the law, of the letter, and the letter being recognized as his teaching here as being of the law, but of the Spirit. And and this is a reality. There are plenty of religions out there that that require works-based salvation. They require keeping of the letter of the law. And of course, you, you hear uh, Jesus in his discourse with, with the Pharisees regularly as, as having these battles with them concerning the letter of the law, the, the washing of pots or the washing of hands or, or all of these other things where, where Jesus would, it would go after them and tell them that they had removed the commandments of God for the doctrines of man and that they, they are following the law of man, not the, the teachings of God. And so that they were a people of the letter, and by the letter they tried to maintain themselves only to fall, but they were not a people of the Spirit. Now, we are called to be a people of the Spirit. And so if, if it is according to the letter of the law that we try to live our lives, then we have proven within ourselves an insufficiency of following after God because there is no man who is capable of keeping the letter of the law. <clears throat> but that our ministry recognizes through repentance that we that we are not sufficient of ourselves, that we lean upon the Holy Spirit of God to guide us. Then we have accepted that we are not of ourselves, but we are a people of God through through leadership of the Holy Spirit, and thus we are made sufficient for His work. He says, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Now, understand that the nature of what he's saying in this point is the letter is recognized as the law. Keep in mind that the law does not save. The law condemns. Therefore, the letter kills. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can bring life because that life is found in the testimony of the Spirit who testifies of Jesus, period. Nothing else. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit's work. 
This is the Holy Spirit's testimony. And as you are filled by the Holy Spirit, you are now the letter of Jesus to the lives of other people around you. Your testimony of salvation, your your sharing of the scriptures and the and the life giving word of God, that the, the connection that you make between your testimony and the life giving word of God for others to be able to come to know Jesus. But everything about you now is about Jesus because the Holy Spirit's teaching and the Holy Spirit's work is to bring people to the knowledge of Christ. Now, the law may be used in this capacity. For as it's revealed in Psalm 19, that the law is perfect, converting the soul, right? There's a conviction that comes from the laws to recognize that man is not perfect, that man is not capable or sufficient of his own self, that is necessary for man to have the Lord. And so sometimes the law is necessary in order to bring a soul or break a soul to, knowledge, to the knowledge that it needs to be saved. But always the Spirit is going to bring forth that life. The Spirit is going to bring forth the reality of Jesus to the hearts of man so that they may be saved. For indeed, the law, as is recognized here in verse number 6, as the letter, indeed the law reveals the nature of sin and thus the strength of sin is the law. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? He says, oh, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And so we find that, that the law itself is not evil. The law itself is not wicked, but the law reveals evil. The law reveals evil wickedness and not only re brings a revelation of it but has a condemnation to it and that is why that is the strength of sin and death is because when the law judges sin it has no forgiveness it has no 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 heart the law is cold it is the letter written in stone as revealed here it is a cold truth and it has nothing but condemnation to follow it and so for the letter in that it kills we find that the only hope you have, the only hope you have from the escaping of this death, this law that is looming upon you, is deliverance from God through faith in Jesus Christ. The only hope you have. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one will come unto the Father except through me. It's only Jesus. He's the only hope. Otherwise, you'll be gripped by death. And thus he, he reveals that in verse number seven, he says that the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, that's my whole point, was glorious, amen, and it is glorious. He says, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, uh, the, the connection of Moses, of course, how dare we go back to the old covenant, right? How dare we? How dare Paul bring us into the face of those teachings of the Old Testament? Well, clearly, two thirds of your whole Bible is in the Old Testament, and and God didn't throw away all of His Old Testament and replace it with just this few letters that are written in a couple of Gospels of the New Testament. And and this this is the teaching of replacement theology. This is the teaching that is false. For, for indeed, if we were to consider and study that old covenant and we were to understand the nature of God and his dealings with mankind up into the point of even Jesus' birth, we would have a clear understanding of the things that Jesus taught. We would have a clear understanding of the, of the attitudes and of the culture and of the people groups that, that Jesus is. By the way, Jesus isn't Roman. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. He, he's, he's born in the tribe of the kings right there in Bethlehem. His connection from his mother as well as his father is being recognized as the kings of Judah. Jesus is a Jew. We cannot Romanize Jesus. We can't, we can't pull him out of his historical and, and, and ethnic context to try and create some kind of, of European Jesus. It doesn't exist. He's a Jew. And we must understand him for who he is in, in his physical form, in, his, in, in the nature of his flesh. He's a, he's a Jew. He grew up 
in, in, in the synagogue schools. He grew up understanding Torah. He grew up studying the, the Haftarah and the, the prophets. And he, he, he grew up with all of this because this is his, his culture, his people. And God hasn't discarded Israel, not at all. God is still very much for Israel and with Israel. But we, we follow the teachings of all of these people of, of the, the Reformation era, of these, these people who, who, who so despised Israel that they, they sought to replace them with themselves, whether it be the Lutheran Church or whether it be the Presbyterian, whatever come out of the, the, the Reformation and are breaking apart of the, the Romans. But you can't do away with Israel because God hasn't done away with Israel. And so it might help us as the churches to really kind of study that history just a little bit. To understand a culture just a little bit so we can better understand our Savior. Just saying. And he comes down and he says that if the ministry of death written in verse number 7 and engraved on stones was glorious, the children of Moses, or the children of Israel rather, could not look steadily at the face of Moses... It's because he was on the mount uh, for, for as many days as has received the law of God written in the stones, but had been in such contact with God that when he came down, his face was glowing and it freaked people out. He had to put a veil over his face. But it didn't last very long. It was passing away. He says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? And amen. It lasts a whole lot longer. <laughs> Praise the Lord. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. And from glory to glory, there, there was a glory of the law without question, for it was the written, written by the finger of God in its original estate, and it was given unto Moses again after he had broke it. But of course, that being in symbolism of the people's hearts being corrupt before God and breaking his law even before they got it. And thus, Moses would have another set of commandments that he would have written and that he would come down off the mountain with. But we understand the glory of that was nothing to be compared with the glory of the, the work of the Spirit that would give us revelation of that law. And thus it comes down and he says, For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. And so that brings us to this third point of our day is recognizing that their minds were blinded and this is his point beginning in verse number 13 he says unlike moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away but their minds were blinded in, in, in connection, it was recognized that veil. When, when Moses put that veil over his face for being in such contact with God, that the, 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 the Shekinah, the, the literal glow of God, the fire of God, was so much on the, upon the presence of Moses. It's kind of like if, if you are too close to a fire for, for an extended period of time, you can get some, some burn from the fire upon your skin. Your skin will turn. Uh, red and and it's because you were in contact with heat of the fire for an extended period of time see you're sitting around a campfire at night you're sitting really close to the fire and you're feeling and it's so warm and it feels really good and you wake up the next morning and your face is red because it's like getting a sunburn because you've been so close to the the, the flames of the fire that you feel the, the the warmth of such a period of time well the same thing is true is 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 that Moses was so close to God Moses was so much in the presence of God that the literal glow of God the glory w w kind of rubbed off on Moses and so when he comes down off the mountain everybody's freaked out because I mean this guy is literally the like nuclear he's glowing so he puts his veil over his face. But in putting a veil over his face, you see it, it blinded the people from the glory of God as well. So that a people could not look upon him to see the, the glow of God's glory on him or within him because he put that veil. So they, they had become blinded. Not that they couldn't see, but that they couldn't see his connection with God's glory. 
You see, he, he covered that from them. And, and this is something so paramount for us to understand today is because of how we cover God's glory within ourselves uh, so that the world around us cannot see his glory. You see, we hide ourselves in the truth of our Christianity at work. We hide ourselves in the truth of Christianity at school. We hide ourselves in the truth of our Christianity at at, at other things, other activities. Just like Moses put that veil over his face and that, that veil becomes a separation between uh, Moses and the people. That veil becomes a separation between the people and the glory of God that's shining off of Moses' face and the testimony of Moses before the presence of God. It's a veil that separates between. So that when you see, in verse number 14, but their minds were blinded, it wasn't that they didn't have eyes that they couldn't see. It wasn't that they didn't have ears that they couldn't hear. It's that their consideration of the things of God were in error or non-existent, and so their minds were blinded. Now, there are some blind people who cannot see with their, their natural eyes, but they have a keen sense of what's happening in the things of God. They, they have a keen sense of of connection of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And though their eyesight they be blind, yet they see much more clearly than most people that have eyes that can see. <laughs> and so that, that we would understand even the blind man of John chapter 9 could see better in the time that he didn't have eyesight than all of the Pharisees who questioned him after his miracle of healing that they, they refused to see. And as Colonel Harding often said in, in, in the Andy Griffith show, in the, in the one episode of, of Colonel Hardy's Miracle Elixir, that there are none so blind as those who will not see. So that it comes down. And he says that their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because their veil is taken away in Christ. By the way, that's all they had in their day was the Old Testament, and it was Jesus who made known the, the truth of the Old Testament to become new. So your new covenant is actually the reality of the Old Testament in every way. For there be only one testament of God that is found coming alive in Christ Jesus and revealed to our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and that is called the Holy Bible, the Testament of God. There's no old, there's no new. We, we made those divisions, and I get it. But the reality is, is that the whole of the old and the new are one covenant recognized in God. But even to this day, verse 15, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Some of ours do. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, that veil, when Moses is read, that veil is taken away. Often makes me wonder why people don't want to study the Old Testament because they believe that, well, we're New Covenant believers. We're not answerable to the law anymore. We're not under that that old covenant, or would have never had a part with it. I'm not Jewish, so I don't have a part with that. We need to study the New Testament. We don't need to study the Old Testament. But when, no matter what book of the Bible you go to in the New Testament, you are studying the Old Testament. We've already been brought back to Moses again and again and again and again by the Apostle Paul, who, by the way, was a Jew. Where do we think that we're learning from when we study the Scriptures but by the Jews? There's not one book of the, of the Bible that hadn't been written except for the possibility of Luke, which I learned just recently is very possible that he himself was Jewish. Uh, so what, where in the world are, are you learning from but the Jews as concerning the faith that you carry as being a Gentile? And aren't you glad that God opened the faith unto us as Gentiles, for in that he would graft us in that the whole world could have the hope of having, having a, a relationship with God? Where in the world do you think you're going to get it from? And thus, he, he reveals it right here. He says, but even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. From one glory 
to another glory. As we grow in the Lord, the glory just keeps getting brighter from one glory to another glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Man, you just can't beat this. So let's thank God for a blessing today. Father, we ask that blessing be upon us and that thou wilt guide us and teach us what we may be able to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys, keep you guys, and cause His face to shine upon you. And I'll catch you tomorrow.